Hi, everyone, and welcome back again to the third Lowe's Foods virtual beer hunting event here at Westbrook Brewing. I'm pretty sure I'm still John Dispenza from Untapped, but originally from the best beer done ever at Lowe's Foods number 215. And I'm most certainly Harrison Hickok, and I'm already halfway through my cheddar cheese straws. You may recognize us from Untapped Stringing Socially podcast, or perhaps... You've seen us in your local beer den trying to decide which Westbrook beer to buy. Fortunately, today, Harrison, we don't have to make any decisions because we've got five awesome beers from Westbrook to enjoy with you all. And we're going to take this tasting to another level. We're lucky to have the one and only Edward Westbrook from uh, Westbrook Brewing, the founder and head brewer there, and Will Cheswick, the portfolio lead from Advantage Distributing, to give us a behind-the-scenes scoop on all these beers that came in your virtual beer hunting box. Lucky us. Speaking of beers... What's today's tasting order, you may be wondering. Well, let's get into that lineup. So we're going to start with White Tie, Belton-style wheat beer with ginger and lemongrass. Then jump over to One Claw, their rye pale ale. Next up will be their American IPA, and then Key Lime Pie Goza, and finishing it all off with the Blackberry Blueberry Smash. It's going to be great. I don't know which one I'm most excited about. Unfortunately, I'll find out after we drink all five of them. (laughs) As you're enjoying your beers with us today, remember to follow on social media and check in, tag Lowe's Foods or Westbrook Brewing Co. You can see those scrolling on the bottom of the screen and use the hashtags beer hunting season, virtual beer tasting or virtual hunt club in any of your social media check-ins, right? Yeah. Yeah, posts, those things, tweets, whatever you want to call them. Um, And if you're feeling smart tonight, extra smart, you may want to add the hashtag winner and winning to that list because we're coming back with more trivia, folks. After having so much fun last time, we had to do it again. So let's quickly break down the rules, how that's all going to work. Pretty simple. All you have to do is scan this QR code on your phone right now and sign in with your email address. So trivia is going to have four rounds. Six questions plus one bonus question per round. Each question is worth 50 points, but bonus questions are worth 100 points. And, and this was this made the difference last time, the first person to answer correctly gets an additional 15 points. So if you know it, hit that answer as fast as you can. The grand prize gets their next beer box for free. Second prize is going to get a $30 gift card to the beer den. Third, fourth, and fifth place. You're going to get prizes too. The game and prizes are only available to those watching us live. If you're joining us after the fact, great. Welcome. You can still have fun and quiz yourself. And most importantly, don't listen to the answers John and I guess. They'll most likely be very wrong. As they were last time, although a lot of fun. (laughs) And if you're wondering how to check in your beers on Untapped so you can earn tonight's virtual beer hunting badge, here you go. Scan this QR code. It'll take you right to the event page where you can choose the beer you're drinking and check it in and earn the badge the easy way. Or if you want to do it the hard way, you can open up the Untapped app on your phone, look for the beer that you're drinking in the search bar, and once you see it, tap that check-in button. But make sure you add the location, either the Lowe's Food Store that you bought it from or the Lowe's Foods Presents Virtual Beer Hunting Event location. Take a photo, rate the beer, add some nice notes so that you can remember it, and then hit the check-in button. Just remember, you have to select the beer and the location in order to earn that badge with tonight's check-in. Awesome. And if you want to get into the conversation we're having tonight uh, with questions, comments, you can. Just, just click on the watch on YouTube button on your screen right now and jump into the comments over there. All right, enough talking. That's not why we're here. It is our pleasure to introduce Edward Westbrook, Westbrook's founder, head brewer, and Will Cheswick from Advantage Distributing. Hi, guys. Come on over. Come on down into the show. Hey. What's up? What's going on, Michael? <laughs> How's it going? How are you guys doing Great. tonight? Great. Fantastic. It's a good night to drink yeah. beer. I know, right? Every night is a good night to drink beer. And some mornings. Um, 
what an amazing room you guys are in. I, I want to dive into what's happening that we'll dive into the barrels, but also learn about it. But I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Let's just let's let's not uh, get too crazy too fast. But I'm pumped about tonight, guys. We're looking forward to it. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. I guess that kind of leaves us at a point now where we're pretty darn close. So maybe everybody should go think about grabbing that first beer. Remember, it's going to be white tie from Westbrook as we're showing off uh. on the videos, except for me, because I have to talk with my hands. We'll be <laughs> right back in 60 seconds after a quick video, something about a beer, a beer den, I think, coming up soon. <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, so now is my favorite part of these virtual beer hunting events where we actually get to drink a beer and not only that, learn some really cool things about it from some people closely involved in it. I want to ask you how many bubbles you put in each can, but perhaps <laughs> we should start with something a little more high level. Like this is a 500,027. <laughs> an odd number. Good. Pay, it's pay always odd. That's trivia. the funny thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. So this is a this is a Belgian style beer brewed in uh, outside of Charleston, South Carolina. I guess it, it, to begin with, if if I can lead with a question, uh, what makes this beer special or a Belgian style in South Carolina? How much did that influence you guys when you put this together? Uh, well, the white tie was actually one of the first three or four beers that we opened with in December, 2010. Wow. Um, and going back even before that, um, when I had first decided to work on opening my own brewery, um, I was a home brewer like many brewery founders were. Um, the, this recipe or like this idea to do like a, an Asian inspired Belgian wit beer was the first thing that I started working on seriously intending it to be for, um, you know, one of our first commercial products. Um, so I went through a lot of iterations, uh, various, many combinations of spices, you know, different kinds of ginger, different forms of lemongrass, um, other spices, you know, lime leaves, galangal, different, you know, weird stuff. Um, but eventually brought it back to just to uh, ginger, and lemongrass. And the Sriracha Ace hops were, ah, is that yes. like a initial decision or did you have to work through a couple different things to that as well? Um, yeah, I think that was one of my early ideas because it was a, at the time it was a relatively new hop. Um, it's, it, it was kind of controversial then and, and still is now like a lot, a lot of people don't like it. And if you, if it's overused in different, certain settings, it's pretty off putting, but um, it has sort of like a very grassy, lemony character when used very sparingly. Um, so we do a little bit of that in the Whirlpool. That was a hop that actually originated from the Saws hop. They were trying to do some kind of manipulating with that hop, and they ended up with something that was very different from what they were intending to do. Um, it's, it doesn't, does not have that noble hop character like you get from a 
Hallertau or a, a Saz hops. It has a very distinct lemon character. Uh, Brooklyn Brewing, their Sriracha A Saison yes, was. Exactly. That's where I heard about it. Was, yeah. It was pretty much the first, the, the beer that put that hop on the map um, yeah. and is pretty much exclusively glow, grown in the US at this point um, after it was kind of utilized and grown in Japan and and, uh, and some of Sapporo's hop farms for a bit, but didn't really take off there. But when you have a, a brewery like Brooklyn to grab onto it, it's, you know, it, it's a definitely an interesting character that adds a lot of, um, that complements the ginger and the lemongrass versus kind of overwhelming it. Yeah, that's that was kind of my observation as well from first sips there. It's and I, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, Brooklyn's Sriracha Ace kind of put this hop on the map. Um, I remember the first time I had that beer in some dive bar in Brooklyn in a cork and cage bottle, and I felt like I was the coolest guy in the room. Um, <laughs> but I want to jump back. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, everyone's had a, a Belgian wit beer. It's not uncommon to have coriander and like orange peel in there. But as you said, as we all know, this is lemongrass and, and ginger root pulling from obviously some some Asian influences there. But was that was there like and you just explain kind of trying iterations? But it like did, was it did a food dish inspire this? Were you like, I'm trying to create a beer for a hot August day, you know, in South yeah. Carolina? Or yeah, tell me a little more about that. Yeah, it pretty much exactly both of those things that you just said. Um, <laughs> I wanted to have something that was, uh, you know, very drinkable in you know the muggy Charleston climate that we have. Right. Um, and also I was inspired by, you know, Southeast Asian cuisine. Yes. Um, so, of course, the traditional Belgian style wit beer uses orange peel and coriander, um, and that's great. Uh, but I, I was trying to come up with something a little different. Um, there's, a, there's a beer you might have heard of called Allagash White, um, so, which is the traditional you know, American version of the traditional Belgian uh, beer. And as far as I'm concerned, that beer... Uh, is and has always been uh, pretty much perfect yep. and i saw no need to try and uh duplicate that so i wanted to do do something with a little bit of a different twist on it yeah yeah that's, that's a great thing about american craft beer is taking ideas and and finding innovation to something that you've you've had before um and th this style in particular i guess if you if you want to call it it's the it was hazy it was it was hazy before hazy was cool. Um, yes. Just given how much wheat and all that and the turbid mash that goes into it, that's, you know, this is a style that was actually resurrected in Belgium uh, almost, I guess, 60, 70 years ago uh, that was almost extinct. And Peter Sellis at the Who Garden Brewery, uh, which makes another classic example of the style, of course, uh, kept it alive. And uh, I think it's one of those styles that people really associate and think has been around forever, which it had been, but there was that opportunity for it to go away. Um, and it's, you know, you, you never think of that as um, with, with beer that styles would just kind of disappear. But if, if no one keeps it going or no one continues to brew it or people go out of business, particularly in that era where there's a lot of consolidation going on, um, then those things just disappear. And, you know, the fact that we get to drink these things is a testament to some of those people who kept it alive and kept it going. So thank you, Paracelis, who, who passed away recently uh, unfortunately, but um, I had a brewery in Texas and all that. Uh, that's right. So that's wow. Well, yeah, it's amazing stuff. You're absolutely right. We are lucky, clearly living in the golden age of beer. Lucky us to be, you know, alive now. It's uh, every day. It's something new. Kind of blows my mind. Um, and this is tasting delicious. And yeah, we're in North Carolina. You guys are in South Carolina. It's like 95 out still. So really happy we started the <laughs> evening with this. I've been looking forward to it all day. <laughs> And this is this is one of those beers that like I, I I used to work at the Lowe's Foods Beer Den and it in a great introduction beer was that wheat beer. And then after you've had three or four, they start to seem really similar. So I love you guys. I wasn't able to get Westbrook when I worked there, but I see a lot of you in our Lowe's Foods now. And I love you for thinking outside the box and bringing some creative flavors to this style. Have you seen any others since you've done this? Uh, Ed, have you seen any other people take a, a, a wit beer and, and fusionize it at all that, that caught your eye? Um, nothing, nothing really comes to mind. Um, another, so aside from Allagash White, another uh, wit beer that I really loved 
at the time when I was starting the brewery and when I was coming up with this recipe was, um, uh, I think it was called Orchard White from V Brewery in California. Um, and I believe, I cannot remember, maybe you guys do exactly what they did with that beer, but I just thought it was a lovely um, example of the, the style. And I think they did a little bit something different with it, but I can't remember what it is. It's a great beer for beer style as a blank canvas that you could really go a multitude of directions with. You could potentially dry hop it. You could go the um, just more spice forward. You can utilize um, different fruits, obviously, you know, the wide spectrum of fruits, um, just given how much those are, seems there's a lot of beer on the market right now, whether it's sour beers, IPAs, even people throwing fruit and stouts and all that. So um, just given that it's that light drinkable and you don't have to add a lot of things to it to get a flavor and character out of it, which is nice too. You don't, it's not a 10% stout that you have to utilize pounds and you know tons of vanilla to, to get that vanilla character to come through. Um, it, it just, you know, allows that creativity and innovation to kind of come forward for any brewery that wants to kind of tackle those things. Yeah. Another, another, another thing I like about it is the, the Belgian wheat beer yeast that is usually used to make these kinds of beers. Um, it has, it's like its own fruit and spice notes, but it is really good at also accentuating any kind of spices or flavors that you add to it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it ends up, unless you go like really really off track it you can usually do some very nice things with whatever you choose to put in it some of that fermentation temperature can really drive some of those that. esters and phenols and all right. that so some of that is another opportunity where it's not only yeast selection but what temperature are you fermenting it at mm. to like pull out some of those different notes that you otherwise and if you ferment too hot then you could get some of those it starts can get plasticky or overly phenolic which is it not a, a pleasant experience. You want to keep it in those nice estuary kind of sweet fruit notes. Um, Lots of absolutely. science. Yeah, and you guys have a few hairs in the brain. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Cicerone. <laughs> I'm just a brewer, really so I, I, use, I use very plain words. <laughs> love the yeast do the talking. Um, I love it. And you guys have this dialed in. I'm, and, you know, obviously, and I'm pumped. We got to start with it. We're going to take a short break right now, but up next, we're going to dive into actually a recipe with this beer, some white Thai chicken thighs, trivia round one is coming up, Then we'll see some more fun with the folks in the beer den, and get ready with one claw. That is next. We'll see you guys in a minute. Hi, everybody. For this recipe with Westbrook beer, we're going to use the white Thai. We're gonna pull in those Asian flavors with some grilled chicken thighs. We're gonna let that marinate for a little bit. And then we're gonna go ahead and make the salad. So I'm gonna show you step by step how to do that. We're gonna start by cracking a beer. And we're gonna marinate the chicken. And I have it in a pan here, but we're gonna to wanna to let this sit completely covered for a good three to four hours. So what I like to do is if I don't, if I have time, I'll put it in a bag. This way you can cover the whole chicken and it helps save room in the refrigerator as well. So we'll let that marinate and we'll come back to there. In the meantime, you can get the rest of your ingredients together. We have some cilantro, a lemon, some jalapenos, which we're gonna grill. And then we're gonna make a sauce to glaze the chicken with as it cooks. For the sauce, we have some light brown low food sugar. We pulled in some local with a Texas peach cha sauce. And we also have some low sodium soy sauce. So for the lemons, so we're gonna cut them into quarters. What I like to do, cut each end off, then we're gonna go down and we're gonna kinda cut the center pith out. We're gonna poke out any seeds. So for the sauce, we're gonna take our light brown sugar and it's gonna be equal parts soy sauce Texas peach chow sauce. That will give us some of the heat and sweetness we're looking for. And if you don't like as much spice, you can always cut down on the, on the chow sauce, but personally, I like a little bit of heat. Now let's go out to the grill. We'll show you some grilling tips, and then we'll come back in and we'll plate the salad. Now that we're ready to grill our white Thai chicken thighs, 
We want to make sure our grill is hot. We have them marinated. They're dried off and slightly oiled. We have our sauce ready to go and everything we need to grill. Our vegetables and our, our lemons. So grill's hot. We're just gonna take the chicken and we're gonna start with the skin side down. As they cook, you wanna brush them with the sauce. And if you like spicy, you can always add the jalapenos to your salad. We're gonna throw these on there and let them cook as the chicken cooks. And we'll throw the lemons on top and let them soften up a little bit. So, now that our chicken's cooked, we cook it to 165 to make sure that it is cooked. And then we have that nice caramelization on the outside. Our peppers are nice and charred. Our lemons are done. We're gonna start putting this on the tray. And we're gonna take it in and finish the salad. All right, now that we have everything grilled, we're gonna make our salad. Chicken's nice and golden brown. So, we have our jalapenos, our lemons that we softened up a little bit on the grill to get the juices easy to squeeze out. We have our cooked chicken, and we have some greens. So this is just some crunchy greens, carrots, a little bit of red cabbage, and some spring mix in there. We're gonna add some dressing from a local little black dress. It's the Far East variety. We're gonna get some cucumbers. I'm gonna throw some cucumbers in there. We're gonna to toss, I like to toss my salad before it's on the plate. This way you get all the greens coated and then you're not just getting the top greens by pouring the, the dressing over the, over the greens when it's already on the plate. So everything's nice and lightly coated. Got the salad there. We take our jalapeno. The jalapenos aren't for everybody, but jalapenos, again, they could be spicy, they might not be, but it adds a little bit of extra heat to it. The seeds, though, they are the, the spiciest portion of it. Top them right up there. Do a little squeeze of the lemon. And then we'll put a piece of chicken right on there. There we go. Simple meal, gives a little bit of a different flair to our grilling experience in the summer. Gets in a, a great beer. Um, I personally like to drink one as I'm grilling. So I, I, I would encourage everybody to try these. It's a different recipe. It offers different flavors that will get us out of our realm and expand our culinary experience a little more. So enjoy. Wow. You've got to be kidding. I just had dinner in that video. I'm just, I'm like, I'm almost out of the cheese straws now. It's a, uh, it's a problem, but that looked amazing. Um, I'm going to have second dinner later, probably being inspired. Anyway, welcome back everyone. I hope you've all been studying hard and are ready to go on this trivia. Eyes on your own phones. No Surrey and Alexa for help. Honor code. John, how do I, let's do a little recap. How do we, how do they win? What's, what's the, what are the rules? <laughs> Well, first of all, it's important that you know how to play. So on your screen, pull out your smart device, your Google machine, scan this QR code and sign in with your email address so that you can play trivia with us live. There's going to be four rounds throughout this event, six questions per round with a bonus question that'll get you some extra points. So each regular question is 50 points. The bonus is 100 points. And if you've got fast fingers, the first person to answer gets an extra 15 points. What is all this for? If you win, if you're first place, grand prize winner gets their next beer box for free. Second prize gets $30 gift, gift card to the beer den. And third, fourth, and fifth place, you guys are going to get something as well. So play, win, do good. If you get the questions wrong, maybe have an extra sip of beer and turn that into a game as well. 
Um, the prize are only available for those of you watching us live. But if you are watching this after the fact, it's still really fun to play and you can do that by yourself. So let's go. Let's get some questions wrong. Right. 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 Oh, boy. Ah, we uh, talked about this. We did. Listening yeah. comprehension. Ed Westbrook is a vampire. He started this in the 1800s, right after college, and he's been keeping it going ever since, I think. <laughs> I thought it was 1980, the year of airplane, when the song Lady by Kenny Rogers topped the charts, but maybe I'm wrong. How do you know all that? <laughs> oh, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, Most you people are right. Don't listen to us. And also, we're not even going to try and read the questions because people you can answer faster than we can think. Well, all right. So, KDL, Will H, Von James, Chloe, all right, good top five here. But again, that 15 points that Katie has, I'm doing it first. It makes a difference. Uh, this one, Ooh. I was only paying attention to eating. Um, right. I heard uh, Chef Joe said a lot of numbers, and <laughs> I think it was <laughs> this is not one that I remember how long right. you should soak your chicken thighs I, I in the beer. Safe to say, probably not 13 days. Let's not do that. All right, good. Everyone knows. <laughs> Everyone's listening better than us. So honestly, if it was 13 days soaked chicken, I would probably still order it. Oh, Dan, jumping up. But go oh, the tie for Katie as well. Will Hollingsworth okay. jumps in the game. All right. It's... Uh, which of these Ivy Ooh. League schools once home to not one but three breweries on campus? Wow! How do you get any, do you get any studying done? How do you? What's the, which? Everyone has the higher dropout rate, I guess, yeah, or completion rate. I wouldn't want to leave. Um, <laughs> That's what what I mean. Are you going Seven home for years. Christmas? No, right. I'm staying here in the dorms. Unfortunately. <laughs> oh, it's Harvard. Yeah, Boston's quite the beer town. Not too surprising there. Uh, how Ooh. about them apples? Ah. And that was a toss up. There we go. Good applesauce for me, please. <laughs> Trying to watch my teeth. Um, look at this. That's a shake up. Here we go. Which of these tropical? Ah. Actually, all of these would be a, a fun beer <laughs> to drink. <laughs> these are great names if you're going to create like a Hawaiian shirt company. This is, yeah. it could be Coconati. Give Pommy Bahama run for his money. Bro Nana was oh. probably one of the breweries uh, in Harvard. Yep. Wow. It could have been. It was Coconati. That's a great name. It sounds like the the coconuts that run the secret government and also taste delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're playing the long game. All right. The thistle glass. Ooh. National what? Scotland's national blank. That's a trick question. Scotland is not a real country. Next. <laughs> well, I think William Wallace would have a few choice words. <laughs> I didn't watch the that. end of the movie. <laughs> hey, a flower. I think I even knew that one. Well, a lot of, a lot of thistle bushes going around for Valentine's Day, I think. That yep. was a giveaway. That was an easy one. Michael Gunther is killing it, but Katie's they're tied still. Will Hinesworth. Yep. That was it was a shakeup for a moment, but now it's pretty clear who the leaders are so far. All right. Desserts. Ah. Uh, if you don't know this one, just go home. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> there lots of food talk tonight. I'm getting good thing I have something to drink. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. Got all these snacks. I'm not gonna have room for second dinner. Hey yo, not messing around in the dessert world. They got all the bases covered. Let's see how the leaderboard's looking. Ooh, almost unchanged. If Don Castleberry jumps in the top five, good job, Don, fighting, fighting from the bottom. Now you're here, as they say. It's something like that. Yeah, something like that started from the bottom. I don't know. Bonus here question. Uh, okay. Oh. Yep. Wow. This is uh, all of my answers were different. So it, it seems Porter, I'm not the one. Porters and quaffles. That was a Harry Potter reference. And also a ale joke. Pints and quarts. Potters and quidditches. Almost. Hey, Katie takes a stop top spot, round one, followed by Yvonne, Debbie, Tina, and then Ashley. Wow, that really shook everything up. 
Yeah, My some gosh. new leaders in the leaderboard. Nice Great to see. First round. Fantastic stuff. Like we said, that if you know it first, that 15 points, I mean, that's the difference right now. It really don't think just you're from the hip like I do for most important decisions. Just go with your gut. <laughs> uh, three <laughs> rounds left. What's coming up next, Harrison? That's right. The beer den team has been marinating on that chicken thigh recipe. So let's check in with them. And if you don't have it ready, be sure to grab your one claw pale ale since we'll be drinking that next. Chef Joe's chicken looks awesome, but Steve didn't plan ahead. He's got company coming over and he needs food in a hurry. Luckily, our pit masters, they'll smoke anything. Check out these chicken thighs. We're making meal prep super easy. Maybe the best food to pair with your beer is a bratwurst. And at our Sausage Works departments, we have some of the best sausages you've ever found. Come on by any of your stores and grab yourself whatever flavor you want. Some of them will cook it up for you, others will be ready to take home and cook yourself. But either way, it's the perfect pairing for that nice cold beer you've got. And whatever you do, don't forget the mustard. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, that is making me hungry for chicken. And fortunately, chickens have two claws, but some I don't. I don't know where I'm going with this. But we're about to drink a beer called. I think one it's like claw. ten claws, <laughs> right? Yeah, Three. Seven, four, six, eight. That's a new beer, right is there. A claw, a hand. Yeah, I'm waiting for Westbrook's ten claw to sing me to sleep. But while. <laughs> No ten, no ten, no ten claw. That would be amazing. Uh, He's at uh, four claws right now. So yeah. I know. I mean, That's amazing. Amazing. Get the ten claw. Yeah. yeah, four claws, Santa Claus. Calm down, calm and, down. Uh, <laughs> this this beer is kind of launched as we all are, are joking about, like a whole slew of beers for you guys. We're up to four claws and Santa Claus now, which I love. But let's focus on one claw, kind of where that all began it is so a lot of things to say about this beer but let's start with the hops so citra is featured was that again kind of going to the drawing board trying some things out and realizing boom citra's the thing or did you know right off the bat uh so this recipe came from originated with a series of single hop rye pale ales that we started doing in probably 2012 um, and we did a couple different ones. Citra of course was in there. We did uh, Nelson Sauvin. That was back when you could still get that hop. Um, <laughs> we did, I can't remember the other, we did some other fun uh, New Zealand hops like Pacific Jade, things like that. Um, but the single hop Citra pale, rye pale ale was, was clearly a standout. Um, and when it came time to do another um, canned or packaged beer, um, 
it was a pretty easy choice to make this one, you know, one of those. And um, didn't want to just call it like single hop citra pale ale because that's boring. Um, so the name for the one claw yes. actually comes from uh, my wife, Morgan, who in our early days, she would go around and do like sales calls, visit bars and and uh, stores and stuff with, you know, the, the big bag of beer samples. And um, one of the Advantage uh, sales reps, um, who is our distributor in South Carolina, um, made a joke that she was like the, the fiddler crab, like with the one claw, because she had like, you know, this big bag dragging, you know, dragging her down. And then she had like, <laughs> her arm would always be up here because she's trying to carry the bag. She's kind of a, a small woman. Um, so that's where the name One Claw comes from. Wow, that's great. I love that backstory. I was wrong every single time I guessed. I don't think I ever would have got that right. Well, that makes it even better. Again, don't trust us on trivia. We don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> I think that's, that's demonstrated well. Uh, you guys also, <laughs> so you mentioned uh, rye in this beer. Every time I see rye in, in, in a beer, I generally just gravitate towards it. Whiskey as well. But rye is a flavor that I love that I really don't know anything about. Can you help me understand why you chose rye? Like what's it bring to this beer um, that makes it kind of special? Yeah, so rye is a very cool grain to use in brewing um, as it is with whiskey. Um, it has a very strong, spicy character, and it also gives a pretty good amount of body and in larger amounts, it can have like kind of an oily, thick mouthfeel that adds to the beer. Um, so we use just a little bit of rye in this recipe. I think it's, it's probably something like 3%, uh, but that is more than enough to give you that, that spice and just a little bit of, of slickness on the mouth. It can be a little difficult to work with in the brewing process as yeah. well in mashing. If you use too much rye, then you can get a, a stuck mash where you're not able to get all those good sugars out there to make beer. So there's a, there's a limiting point, but I think a lot of times when you think about the, the need for in a, uh, a mash bill, basically what your what malts you're using to create the beer that you can use a very small percentage of those things to get a, a huge amount, particularly when you're looking at darker beers and how little actual dark malt you need to make that beer black or, or, or dark brown. So it's really nice here as a, as a compliment to the kind of the spice character from the hops and just complements the uh, the overall the kind of drinking experience of having that little bite to it that cuts through some of the sweetness that you get through some of the maltier parts and some of the fruit uh, notes from the hops. With this oh, being uh, one claw, Harrison mentioned two, three, four claws, the Christmas claws. Obviously, we're waiting for 10 claws probably coming soon. <laughs> but uh, for a moment, we pivoted to whiskey. And one of the uh, beer den masters, uh, Tammy, who's a beer den master in Carolina Beach in North Carolina, uh, she asked if I can read correctly. Um, once we brewed the tropical stout, how did you come up with the idea to do buried treasure? Um, does that... Is that is a question just about the where, where the name came from, or a little fuzzy on exactly? Me too. What the so I'll is. I'll add I'll add some context um, because I've bought beer from Tammy before, and I think what she's asking is you did the tropical stout, and then I, I, what what like was there uh, maybe you got some good customer feedback about this is a cool take on on a on a normally like ch coffee chocolate beer did that influence you to go for buried treasure after that um which tropical stout are we talking about <laughs> <laughs> not quite sure i think it's a lot of the kind of the rum notes is is one of those kind of the the link between some of those beers that i you know edward being a, a big rum drinker i think kind of picking up some of those thoughts and like influencing in different ways, whether it's the yeast or whether it's adding adjuncts or whether it's using rum barrels, particularly to kind of add some of those notes to build out beers that 
have some of those tropical characters, but tropical is such a broad kind of, it's saying, it's similar to saying citrus. It's like, well, what spectrum are you talking about? Are you talking about the peel? Are you talking about the fruit? Are you talking about the, 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 you know, the juice, um, all that. So I think there's a lot of things at Westbrook overall that there's like some common threads that kind of link other beers to each other. Similarly, just like in an obvious series, like the claw series where there's multiple iterations of that or rinse and repeat, which are those hazy IPAs yeah. that there's just different takes on, um, kind of various hot combinations that that you know progress through and you always know what you're kind of getting into but then it's it's nice to have it slightly different just how craft beer drinkers are now it's you know having the same thing isn't always what they're necessarily looking for but if they know they already like the previous thing then to transition to something that's slightly different is is obviously very easy and it's something they really look forward to too uh, so now i remember we we did do a collaboration with evil twin um, a couple years ago, that was a tropical imperial stout. It was like a pina colada stout with um, super huge imperial stout with pineapple and coconut. Um, so maybe that's what she was referring to. Um, you, but the, the collab do a collaboration with Lowe's Foods too. Yes. So um, when we we're, I was talking with Lowe's about doing the beer collaboration. Um, uh, Joe, the the brewer up in, in Greenville or Simpsonville, I think, um, he wanted to do a tropical stout. And um, his actually his idea was a, like a, a, I think it was a pina colada stout. And I was like, well, we just did this one <laughs> evil twin. So we decided, you know, we flipped it around and, and we did, um, a, you know, a big uh, sweet stout with a lot of raw sugar in it, uh, put it in rum barrels. And then we did... Um, you know, coffee and coconut treatment. It's good. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds like it would have been <laughs> right. really good. Yeah. That's right. Good way to start the day. Good way to end the day. It's one of those beers. That's a uh, fantastic sounding. Holy guacamole or holy pina colada or whatever. Cool. Um, I guess um, we probably have a lot more beers to drink. And I know there's some other things that we have to cover. Coming up next, uh, we've got One Claw Beer Quickles, which probably wasn't on your initial roadmap, but I think <laughs> Beer and Pickles is, I mean, it, yeah, I'm excited to see this video. We've got more trivia round twos coming up. There's a little bit of shenanigans that we'll see from the beer den. And we'll be coming back with, Westbrook's American style IPA uh, in the next beer tasting as well. Let's do it. For this recipe with Westbrook beer, we're going to do some quickles. So for this, we decided to use the one claw. Adds a nice flavor to the pickles and kind of enhances the overall experience. These pickles, they're called quickles for short because the canning is not for preservation. All we're gonna do is add the ingredients you see here to the pot, let it boil, add our cut vegetables. So we're gonna start by adding two beers. Now everything in this recipe you see is in this jar right here. So when you do cook with beer, you don't have to worry about the, the alcohol after you cook with it because once it does reach the boiling point, it will cook off that residual alcohol and you'll be left with a flavor. So you can see we're, we're just adding everything in the pot. We're gonna add the salt and sugar. White vinegar. And all you really need to do is make sure the sugar and the salt dissolve. Three bay leaves. Turmeric, turmeric's an optional item. It can go in. This one is without the turmeric. All the turmeric will do is kind of brighten the color up a little bit. It doesn't really add any flavor element. For the pickling cucumbers, we have some sliced up here and all we did was cut the end off. Set that aside, because we're not going to use that. And we just cut them on a bias. You can cut them into slices. You can dice them. 
But for this, I, I like to cut them this way because you can still top them on a burger. You can still cut them up if you need to afterwards. And they're, they're a nice condiment to eat with grilled items. Any, any fatty barbecue that helps, helps complement it and also helps, helps the eating experience. So we're just gonna continue to slice these. One thing to make sure is they are all even, consistent slices. Uh, you don't want any really thick ones. You don't want any really thin ones. This way they do all pickle the same, same length of time. Once this comes to a boil, we're gonna add these, but first I wanna show you a little tip of cutting garlic. So I already peeled it. When you start slicing it, I just slice them really thin. Some like to smash it, I, I slice it, but I make one slice or two slices, fold it over, so then I have a flat edge to work with. And then I'll just cut them real thin. All right, we're boiled, so we're gonna have everything in. Again, the onions are sliced real thin. You could dice them as well, but I like to slice them. This way you can lay them on a sandwich or a pickle as a pickled option. We're gonna push these under. And we're just gonna let them sit. Now you wanna let them sit and stay covered. The amount of juice in here, there will be some residual juice. That's okay. When you store them, you do wanna make sure you cover the pickles for storage. Once they're produced, you can let them stay in the refrigerator for up to three days. After that, I would, I would not consume them. Uh, usually that's a good rule of thumb. Again, quick pickles, canning isn't for preservation. This is all for flavor. And it, the boiled product, it does help tenderize everything, but you'll get a nice crisp pickle out of this. I'll take a few out and show you. So you have your onions, you have the pickles, they do darken up a little bit. Again, if you add the turmeric, it will kind of brighten the color up a little bit. So there's some quick tips on condiments you can make for a summer grill. Enjoy. Virtual beer tasting and garlic slicing tips. This this is what I've been waiting for. And trivia, round two is coming up. So who do you think is going to win, Harrison? Not me. me. I like, yeah. yeah, right. I like, I mean, Katie keeps fighting back. She's been number one almost the entire first round, but it's early still. I mean, I feel like last time, number, uh, number one was like a surprise finish out of nowhere. So we'll see what happens. Anyone's game. All right. Ooh, not. These are one of those tricky SAT questions. The word not is in that question. Which of these is not the name? Uh, always got me every time. Stepping on toes. Cotton candy caribou. That's like the electric slide, I think. Oh, and a beer. <laughs> Cotton candy right caribou. Answer. A very popular TikTok dance in the early 1990s. I don't think that was around yet. <laughs> hey, Yvonne jumps up. We get Katie's right there. Will's back. Debbie and Jessica, welcome to the top five. There's prize money in that top That's five. Right. Which Ooh. organ filters alcohol in the human body? Uh, all of them. Right. If it's the brain, you're doing, or the lungs, rather, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're not. Oh, boy. It's a rough lesson to learn. Hopefully we all know this one by now. There it is. Wow, there's our first 100 percenter. That's great. A biology Perfect. panel today. <laughs> Sorry. Good job paying attention in school. All right, Yvonne's up. Kate's right there. Will, Debbie. All right, a lot of, seen a lot of the same names up here. Here we go. Would Which not be considered okay. a traditional beer snack. All right. Well, Ooh. Hmm. I mean, there's one that jumps out at me. If I was playing, if I was playing this smart, I would be on the couch with my wife and I and yeah. I would just pick whatever she doesn't pick. <laughs> I would just pick what my wife picked. I don't know when <laughs> that'd be the smart. At least if I'm yeah. wrong, I'm not getting in trouble. Doesn't matter. Uh, all right, Yvonne's up at the top. Katie, Will, Debbie, Jessica, let's go. It's still anybody's game, but I will say, I'm starting to uh, pull away a little bit. Pickle soaked in beer. 
um, you should know you should know this and you should have some happening right now. That's right. Why not? Yeah. And you could probably use a lot of different fun beers. I'm almost thinking of like doing it with a spicy beard too. Uh, we know Chef Joe mm -hmm. likes the heat. That's right. Quickles. No votes for tickles. So at least that's that's good. Nobody votes for tickles. That's a it's a trap door. It's a trick. <laughs> it's still anyone's game. Case made a comeback. I tied at five hundred. Ah, Maximum Ooh, Florida is a great beer. Great name. Yep. Great beer. Great news headline. Don't overthink this one. Don't overthink it. Maximum yeah. Florida. The bald eagle. <laughs> Yellow hell ah, good flamingo. I think flamingo is the state bird of Florida. I have no yeah. I have no research state done bird. on that. That's it. The state bird of Florida is a New Yorker that visits for six months. <laughs> I was gonna say, right? Yeah. Someone from the Midwest who has a condo in Naples. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, most recent year of legal drinking age, you could have been Ooh, born. This uh, one's going to make a lot of people feel old, I bet. Yeah, and I sad. heard I heard about this, this easy. It's a, it makes it easy now. Maybe that's kind of a, if you're checking IDs. Yep. It's 2021, folks. Ugh. You could be born in this century and drink alcohol now. Well, oh, look, look at this! That. But look at three people but tied at six hundred. Three yes. person tie. Well, that's one way to, to get some money out of the beer den. Uh, that's, that's right. It. All right, bonus question. Let's go. Ooh. Oh Ooh, man, this is just about impossible. Right to like a samurai <laughs> sword, multiple folds. That's Two where it gets its strength. Cut it open and take the beer out. Ooh. 13. No one guessed 20. That's a real, that's the hardest question I think we've seen on the trivia for the last two. Hey! Yvonne jumps right up to the top. And Kenneth, Kenneth Starton jumps into the top five. This was another great round. It's anyone's game still, as we've clearly seen, but we've got another <laughs> quick, fun video from the beer done. And then make sure you've got Westbrook's IPA ready to go. Maybe even pour it early. Grab a taste. We'll be back really soon. Chef Joe's got an awesome pickle recipe, but our friend Steve, his knife skills are not great. So his alternative is he can come to the Lowe's Foods Produce Department, grab some cucumbers, had to pick and prep, get a basket. He didn't have to put his beer down. So Steve can just take his cucumber over here to our pick and prep sous chef, and she'll cut it up just the way he wants it. Steve may not be a chef, but he doesn't cut corners either. He's definitely putting turmeric in his. He doesn't need much, so he headed to the Spice Bazaar. You know what? It's a hot day outside. Steve's got a lot on his plate. Maybe we save the pickle making for another day. This one's got turmeric already in it. And that's how a beer den master makes beer pickles. Back to the beer.
Welcome back All right. again, everyone. We're about to drink a beer that I first checked into on Untapped five and a half years ago. Hey, yo. Um, so it's time for a refresher, and I'm sure Harrison's got some questions to ask about this IPA, the hops that are in it. Um, Absolutely. And hi to you, Dan. Drinking out in Surf City with us today. Uh, Harry, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you take a sip? Hops, hops, hops. This is a classic American style IPA. I think I was reading about it. It's got Centennial and CTZ in here, which are two of my favorites. But why am I talking about it? We have Ed and Will here that can tell us way more. So, again, similar question that I had in the other ones was this beer kind of always wanted to make just a classic American IPA. And these were the hops to do it with. Or was there some tinkering that went on to create this guy as well and realize this is our flagship? This is the IPA that we want everyone to think of us when they enjoy. Yeah, so the the white tie and this IPA were the first two beers that we uh, ever canned. Um, so it was obviously one of our, our main things uh, from way back in the day. Um, I don't have like a, a super funny or cute story about how I came <laughs> up with it. It was mostly just like, um, you know, if you're a brewery and you want to make money, you, you should have an IPA. So that's why we started with an, you know, with an IPA. Um, it's a style that's not super cool right now. Uh, you know, West Coast IPA, more on the clear side, you know, than the hazy side for sure. We use a, a yeah. clean American ale yeast. Um, we use a little bit of crystal malt in it, which is definitely not cool these days. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it has, we use, uh, Cascade and Centennial in the boil and the Whirlpool. Um, and then it's pretty heavily dry hopped, uh, about three pounds per barrel with uh, Centennial, Simcoe and Amarillo. So all pretty classic American standards as far as, uh, IPAs go. Yeah. And you really like that Cascade and the, and the boil to give that, that bittering citrus kind of classic quality that you would get. I mean, if you're looking at the progression, Cascade was that first couple decades of American craft beer was the forefront. Now it's Citra. It's just another C. Uh, <laughs> another hop starting with C, um, just like so many of them are like Centennial. And I think Centennial kind of crosses that bridge where it's it's been around for a good amount of years and has been a lot of classic beers. Um, and, and it's still relatively popular, even with some of the um, the, the more haze focused breweries. Um, it, it's definitely one that kind of has that dual purpose. And Amarillo is just a, is kind of what they call a super version of Cascade, just as a more intense version of that. Um, and it, it definitely sits more, I would say in the modern realm of things. And Simcoe is another one that's, it feels like it's been around forever and it's just kind of lurking in the background, but um, has that great grapefruit, like that pink grapefruit character that yeah. kind of shines through that just adds something a little bit different than your, uh, than maybe, a, you know, some of the pineapple or tr more tropical notes or more your stone fruit like peach and, and that. So it just adds a little bit more bite. If you overdo it though, it can get a little catty, um, yeah, onion for, yeah, oniony and yep. just not very pleasant. Um, so that one you have to definitely take some precautions with when you're brewing, uh, just to get that right profile. But I think obviously there's some definite thought behind what, what thing or what hops are getting utilized on the hot side versus the cold side with this to really amp up those things that are going to find those nice fruit four notes that really invite the drinker to come back to the beer um, and then provide those kind of balancing notes in the hot side to have that bitterness to back up the malt character because most of your IPAs getting brewed this day are not this tinge of uh, kind of almost <clears throat> an orangey color. Uh, they, they more look like almost Pilsners or maybe a couple shades darker than a Pilsner. Uh, so you really need that good, solid bittering character throughout or you're going to have kind of an off balance beer. Have you guys, as you if, as you've been brewing this beer for so long, can I say that a long time? We'll say, um, have you had to make any adjustments to kind of keep the the end product the same as hops and everything changes year to year, or has it been pretty easy to maintain? Um, so uh, for the past, I would say two to three years, it's been pretty consistent uh, with the same hop recipe and process. 
Uh, before that, it was always this, you know, it was always a West Coast style IPA, but we played around a lot with different hop combinations, hop varieties, dry hopping methods, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it has, it has evolved a lot from the beginning, uh, but we've pretty much settled on, you know, what's in this can right now for the past, you know, <clears throat> two, three years. And it's sometimes hard to keep a beer recipe over 10 years the, the same, just given how some of the hop contracts you get if you're a new brewery and trying to get you a, a good solid hop to use is not always that easy because you don't mm -hmm. have buying power, you don't have the connections or networking to like kind of get those things where you can get that solid. So you're really just grabbing the hops that you can get. But once you're more established brewery and those um, hop farms are more willing to work with you or you're buying other hops from them, then you can get more of a consistent um, hop profile that you're getting on a, a yearly basis with each of those harvests. You can go out and pick them yourself so you can keep those hop profiles the same versus, um, you know, maybe earlier in the days where you're, that beer is going to have less consistency just based off. And, you know, hops are a, a product that gets grown. So it's just like blueberries or it's wine grapes or anything else like each vintage if you want to you use that word is going to be slightly different and each plot on that hop farm is going to provide a slightly different um character it's it's in, insanely interesting and fun to to get your hands in there and smell one hop across different plots in one hop farm and see how distinct they really are um and that's something that brewers are consistently having to to deal with is just how to kind of maintain that flavor profile that they know their customers like, and they know that the people who drink their beer all the time, like um, when there's so many other things that are going on that are kind of outside of their control. Yeah. Great, great points. It's a definitely exciting time on the hop side of things with States like Michigan and Colorado and Idaho got creating great, you know, hops that are used in beers. You can drink all over the country, all over the world. Uh, where 10 years ago was pretty much the Pacific Northwest. If you wanted a lot of these hops, we had to go. So, and Centennial is one of those hops that's, yeah, that's, that's, you can now um, grow it all over the place. So that's been, been amazing. And yeah, drinking this beer, I'm taking it back to like, right, the kind of drinking early days of my craft beer experience with like green flashes, you know, uh, West Coast IPA and double so Bear Republic, from, maybe. Exactly and, right. Yeah. Racer <laughs> 5, yeah, yeah Hophead yeah. Red. I mean, those right. are just great, great beers that, you know, yes, everyone's loving the hazies, but we wouldn't have hazies without the West Coast. Kind of had to start the IPA journey somewhere. So um, this is this is fantastic. It's, speaking of that, so it's easy to talk about hops in these beers, but you mentioned already, Ed, the malt profile, and, and it, you will eat it too. It's, it's different. It's not, you look at this beer and you don't think maybe IPA right away. So can you spend a little bit more on that? It's not just pale two-row. It's a little bit of crystal, you said, or using some something else for the color as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it's mainly two row pale, uh, but there is a little bit of, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's 40 L crystal malt, which is uh, on the lighter side of crystal. Um, and then we use a little bit of Munich malt and then a little bit of malted wheat as well. Um, just for a little bit of, you know, the wheat sort of gives you that little bit of like that tartness, um, some, some uh more retention on the foam yeah wheat's super important with head retention so it's always nice to add and, and just like we were talking about with one claw in terms of the rye addition being at three percent this is similar like with those crystal malt additions and the wheat and uh, some of those things you, you only need a couple percentage points to really change that character especially with munich just being such a dark malt something that you associate with oktoberfest beers with that rich amber color um only a couple percentage points and you just get that kind of multi sweetness that yep. balances, you know, is the counter punch to that bitteringness that you get from the cascade in the a hot side of things. Yeah. In a, in a, in a recipe, a, a grain bill like this for this IPA, you can think of the, like the Munich malt, the wheat malt, the, the crystal malt as almost like your spices when you're making your recipe. Cause you know, just a, li a little bit goes a long way. Absolutely. It does. Awesome. Cool. Love it. Great question uh, from there one of the launchers from Daniel. I don't know if you guys can read it, but it's a question that I think anyone that's drank more than one Westbrook beer asks to themselves. How do you guys pick the animal that's on each of your cans? Ah, okay. Well, for the IPA, um, we've got the elephants. And, of course, 
that comes from uh, the name India Pale Ale. Uh, let's see, hopefully they're, yeah, it looks like they've, they're Indian elephants. So that's correct. Um, so that's where, that's where the elephants come from on the, on the IPA. Um, for like the white tie, it's sort of like a, our designers came up with a weird um, giraffe, tiger, hybrid kind of looking creature. A tiger maybe? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's, that was sort of like a, you know, like an Asian influence. Yeah. Kind, kind of like thing. a Thai related. Yeah. Yeah. Name. Makes sense. Uh, and then obviously one claw. One claw. Easy. Crab. Yeah. Yeah. That's a an easy love one. <clears throat> yeah. Icing cake to cake. I love it. This is great though. Um, all the stories you can tell with a beer on the can and the glass, all that cool stuff. Fantastic. Well, thanks for another killer round of tasting this beer guys. We're going to actually... I think to learn a little bit more about the room you guys are in next and then do some more trivia and the one and only key lime pie goes is coming up after that. I can't wait. All right, here we are in front of our main brew house. This is where um, every single drop of Westbrook beer that you might drink or see out in the market comes from. It all starts right there. Uh, we have a pretty standard setup as far as brew houses go. Uh, we cover the four main steps, uh, mashing, lottering, boiling, and whirlpool. Uh, four separate vessels for each of those. Um, our particular setup is a little bit fun because it's sort of a hybrid of two different brew houses that we've put together. Um, you can see behind me right here, there's two vessels closest to me. Uh, here and behind that one are from our original brew house that we installed in 2010 and then the other two which are that one and the whirlpool which is on the far corner um, are newer vessels that we added on in 2019 which has really helped us to expand our production. Now after the beer um, finishes the the boiling and the whirlpooling steps in the brew house we send it through our heat exchanger and into our fermentation cellar. All right, so here we are in our little uh, brewery inside a brewery. Uh, this is our pilot or small batch brewing system. And whereas with our big brew house, we make about 1,300 gallons per brew. Uh, this guy makes about 150 to 170 gallons uh, per, per batch. So my original plan for this was to have a sort of a test brew house where we would test out new recipes and then scale them up um, back onto the big system for full production. Uh, but really what's ended up happening is we've gotten so good at just um, brewing on the big system that we can go right from an idea to a recipe over there. So this is basically our toy. All right, so that pretty much covers our uh, pilot or small batch brew house. Um, so let's go take a look at another fun spot in the brewery, uh, our primary wood cellar. All right, guys, we are here in our original barrel room. Uh, you might see behind me, we have several large oak vessels. Uh, the name for these guys is called fooders. Um, as you might remember from the fermentation cellar tour out there, um, we have some large stainless steel tanks. Uh, the purpose of these is pretty much just the same, uh, except that they're a vessel for wild and souring bacteria to uh, live in the wood and come from the wood uh, into the beer. Right. In our other barrel aging room, we have um, a lot of uh, bourbon barrels and wine casks and different spirit casks like uh, Calvados, um, Brandy, those types of things. Um, and the difference between those types of barrels and these guys um, is with those smaller barrels, what we're really looking for is to impart the flavor of the spirit and the wood into the beer. So for example, your bourbon barrel aged imperial stouts, um, of which we have made a few in the past 10 years, um, those take about a year, up to a year in the barrels and they really pick up a lot of that super charred vanilla, oaky and bourbon character. Um, with these types of uh, fooders, really it's more of a vessel to develop um, the beer using various microorganisms. And we're not really trying to impart any wood 
uh, or toasty character to the beer itself. Uh, this is our newest fooder. Uh, we got it a couple years ago. Uh, as you can tell, it's very shiny and unblemished. Uh, this fooder was actually purpose built for us by a company called Fooder Crafters. Um, they make lovely um, and very easy to use vessels. Um, so it's brand new wood. They do a very light toast. Um, so we're not picking up too much heavy uh, spicy oak flavors from the, uh, from the light blonde beer that we have aging in here. And if we move right over here, this is one of our older ones. Um, it's sort of a cylindrical shape. Uh, this comes from um, a Chianti winery in Italy, if I remember correctly. Um, we have the same type of base beer aging in it, um, but we do pick up a little bit of a different um, uh, culture because of the wine that was in this tank before and also because the shape um, allows for a little bit more head space um, surface area on the beer. All right, and here we have our two oldest fooders. Uh, we got these in September of 2014. I can tell from looking on our, our records. Um, these came from or, a, a Bordeaux winery in France. And the reason that a lot of these older tanks come from wineries is because wineries use these to ferment their wine. Uh, after a couple of years or you know maybe a decade or two, Sometimes they'll get uh, some wild yeast contamination in the tank once that happens. Uh, for most wineries, it's no good. They can't use it anymore, so they sell them off. And um, a lot of breweries and other places like distilleries will buy them up and use them for aging. And then continuing on, we have another fooder from Italy. This is interesting because it's actually made out of chestnut, and it was used by an Italian winery to um, ferment Nebbiolo. And now we come to, of course, everyone's favorite part of the tour, the tap room. Uh, this is where we showcase all of the beers that we ha currently have available. Um, if you haven't visited us, I encourage you to do so. Uh, we have 20 beers on tap, a wide variety of canned and bottled beers to go, uh, such as our Mexican cake, Imperial Stout, which I believe has also just hit shelves at the Lowe's stores in North and South Carolina. Um, that's our May Imperial Stout release. Um, we also have some bottles here of the Gates of S'mordor. It's another one of our favorites. It's a s'mores inspired Imperial Stout that we do every winter. Uh, another fun thing about coming to the tap room is finding some tap room exclusive bottles. Um, this is a new project that we just put out called uh, Adjunct Assault inspired by my love of um, all things death metal. Uh, so we did a little death metal inspired label and it's an imperial stout uh, with banana, coconut, and vanilla. So that's, that's a fun one. All right, well, I hope everyone has enjoyed the tour and now back to the tasting. Just so casual with that. Banana, coconut, death metal stout, no big deal. If you want to stop by, you can get some. Yes, I want to stop by. Right. Um, Likewise. Yeah. My gosh, bananas and coconuts. You have me at death metal, but also bananas and coconuts. It's important to stay hydrated when you're rocking a death metal and banana has a lot of potassium. So this is makes total sense to me. All right. Enough about that. Sounds like I know something that's silly. We all know now that I don't. Let's take a look at the leaderboard. Trivia. Yvonne. I'm not going to call it yet. We're one bonus question apart in the top five, and I'd imagine yeah. there's a couple of people right behind this too. So I'm excited to see where we end here at uh, trivia off. round three. Whoa, wow. how many beers? Oh, all right. Hopefully you were paying attention. I believe they just gave us this answer. It's 100. Westbrook has 100 of their own <laughs> beers on tap at any I given time. I don't see that. Yeah, I don't see 100. Oh, you have to there. add them all together. Got it. Boom. 20. 84% of you nailed it. Good start. Strong start to this, the third round. Ooh, and Kenneth Ooh. jumps up. Starting. Starting and uh, finishing strong. Starting. Well, yes. Oh, man. Starting and finishing. All right, Kenneth. 
Uh, which of the below is not a type of Westbrook not. Brewing Company beer? Tricky, tricky. Ooh, peanut butter shake IPA. I don't know if I missed that <laughs> or if that hasn't happened in my life, but I'm ready for it. Just Ooh. do like a half and half pour with the strawberry shake one. Hey, yo. So I guess it is. It only right. watermelon. Man, peanut butter shake. That'd be dangerous. That's, yeah. Uh, Kenneth holding on to first place after that one. A little bit of a shakeup, I think. Yeah. In the top five. Emily Deal jumps into the top five. Welcome, Emily, Emily was with us last. Okay. Uh, oh, that's right. Too. Yeah. All right. April 7th, National Blank Day in the U.S. Oh, man. Soft Pretzel April Day. 7th. April 7th. National Sorry You Got Fooled Day. Rem remember, remember the 7th of April. And that's not how that goes. <laughs> May the seventh be with no, that's not it either. <laughs> some kind of pneumatic device. I'm curious Let's to see. see what this is, honestly. Oh, well, um, well, Kenneth knew, um, <laughs> and it looks like most of the other folks did here in the top five. Doing well, Debbie's back too. Rooting for Debbie. You're it's... you're picking favorites, Harrison. Eh, I don't know. Just help me where I can. These? It's a real book parroting a popular children's book. Okay. Ooh. I'm out of my green kegs and ham. Love it. That's, That's awesome. Be. These could all be <laughs> very hungry cat of Pilsner. That's well. Ooh, good night brew. Okay. All right. Green I kegs can... and ham still available. I was going to say budding children's authors out patent there. Patent pending. Patent pending. <laughs> Got it. It's mine. Ah, <laughs> uh, Kenneth is happy. He's coming into his own. Three beers in. Kenneth knows That's how to right. play trivia. Now. He's the, the person zone. you want on your team. <laughs> uh, oh wow! Well, uh, I think I may know this one, but well, I'm not, we I'm just not did a away. podcast about Westbrook. Brewing, we did, and we were researching their website, uh, and so I, I, I've, I've done. I know this one exactly. Likewise. And so Ooh, do most so of do you. Most. Yeah. Although, Festbrook, good guess. I mean, Oktoberfest can get crazy, so not surprising there. But Kenneth, powering wow. through. Look out. He's separating himself from the pack right now. He's got almost a 200-point advantage. Holy cow. Kenneth in the zone. Not the word for beer in any language. All right. Ooh. This feels tricky, this question. That's are we counting like Klingon and uh, <laughs> right, right. language? Any and... language we don't. Good call, John. We don't know every language yet. This would be one I would argue with my professor. You <laughs> haven't heard of that language yet. Exactly. But... <laughs> you, you'd be in the Jeopardy episode they never aired, John. Yeah, every word means forth. beer in that language. <laughs> my gosh, Kenneth, what are you doing? That's incredible. <laughs> He's answering on two phones. Can you even get that many points? Okay, here it is, the bonus question. Someone is ready to unseat Kevin with a great wow. question here. What a lot of knowledge in this. 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's hard to do. It is hard to do to have everybody say this shouldn't have happened. Some of those people should have been in the pre-production meetings saying, let's not make this movie. Toby Keith adds another... Thing to his resume. I would have guessed <clears throat> Kenny Loggins. Uh, I'm more of a Loggins and Messina guy, the solo stuff, other than uh, Danger Zone. Ooh, I think oh, Kenneth right. held on to first place, but it looks like for we sure. made up some ground for the, for the people is. on his tail. Everyone else is tied for second. So, again, it's still anyone's game. It's all about bonus questions and answering first, and you can go from fifth to first in two questions. Mathematically, I think you're correct, but I'm also not an expert. What I am excited about is this Key Lime Pie Gosa, which is one of my all-time favorite beers, and it's coming up very soon. So get to your fridge and make sure it's ready to go here. We'll see you in a couple of seconds. Let's do it.
the lemon cucumber one better. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. And we're back with the beer heard around the world. I remember when this beer came out. Yeah, I think John told me about it, and it was like every beer forum and every person you knew who liked a beer was like, Key Lime Pie Goza, Key Lime Pie Goza. It was like a whole, it was like a summer blockbuster of a beer, and here we are enjoying it today. So I buried the lead a little bit there, but let's just talk about this beer. Again, inspirations, obviously Key Lime Pie, South Carolina. Let's just, was this like an obvious thing or and something you all wanted uh, to do? Or Yeah, tell me about it, Ed. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of obvious, but, you know, as you guys probably know, we released the regular Goza in, uh, I think it was July 2013, in the six-pack cans, and um, got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of publicity for that. I think it was the first canned sour beer in the United States at the time. Um, and it was kind of a, I mean, I don't want to say it was like a surprise hit because I was pretty excited about it and I knew it was good. And I was confident that once people got over the, the trepidation of like, you know, like sour beer, what, you know, what is this, that, um, that it was going to be a, a pretty good thing. Um, so that worked out and we went with that for a couple of years and, um, in 2016, I wanted to sort of expand the lineup. Um, we had done we had done a couple like experimental things in our tap room, um, and always wanted to do something that was not a standard um, flavor that you expect in a in a sour fruit beer. So I wanted to make like a de, a, a dessert fruit beer, if you will, and of course, I had to choose the best dessert, which is key lime pie. Don't argue with me. It's, you know, you will, I don't care. Key lime pie is the best dessert. Right. Um, that's the right answer. I don't care. So yeah, that that's so that's what we did, and it has uh, it, we use the same recipe as the base goza, um, but we add key lime puree, we add um, Madagascar vanilla and cinnamon, and that's where you get the the lime, and then the the pie and then the crust flavor from. Wow. I would have sworn you dry hop this with graham crackers in fit. Like, <laughs> nope. Nonsense. That's the key element, I think, with the beer that makes it when you have other key lime pie beers or other beers that kind of mimic those pastries or pies or cakes is getting that crust or that um, that cake part of it that's really difficult whether it's malt or whether it's something like vanilla to get that but that's a key element that puts those beers to that next level is when you can get that characteristic crust um yeah in there yeah and this was this was 2016 so at the time like just straight up putting desserts into the beer was not like a thing right so i was trying to get the just the flavor you know the key flavors of the dessert into the beer without actually you know dumping pies into the beer but there is a beer that you which we now, which we, had, which we do now do yes throw <laughs> whole key lime pies. but, then, but you know. this is the the original yeah that's the pie like the math um simple pie right. goes version yeah. in 16 ounce cans that how many uh pies key lime pies do you throw in that beer uh well william it's uh it's actually <laughs> 22 pies per seven barrels of beer wow wow it's like a formula um yeah, I think the great thing about this is that given how the base beer is is very assertive in terms of acidity and the salt character, that the, the vanilla really kind of brings it back a little bit and is uh, maybe a bit more palatable to a person who's just getting into sour beers that wants to try a sour beer and likes key lime pies and they can get it and they're not overwhelmed in any sort of way and, and, and feel like they're their palate's been kind of blasted to where they can't drink anything else for the rest of the night. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I remember when Gozik first came out, I was in a bomber and just never, never knowing the style before, or like had not come across that. And um, now in Charleston, it's just a thing that people, everyone knows that style. And I think, you know, it's, it speaks a lot to a lot of breweries who've kind of revitalized some of these styles and brought them to uh, people to where they know about them that otherwise would have never known what a goza was. And I, you know, 
not to bring another brewery into this, but Coast with their Kolsch, like that's another style that a lot of people probably had not had until yep. they brewed that beer. So um, it, it's just nice to have those things to where you can, when other breweries come into town and they, people are, do people know about Goza down here? I'm like, yeah, because Westbrook Brewing has been brewing one for years and years now. So it's not anything that, uh, you know, someone at a beer bar or anything wouldn't know what it is. So uh, it's, it's really put that style on the map that was so obscure for, years and years and just no one really knew about so it's nice and now at this point there's you know it's almost ubiquitous that it's just a style that people know about in craft beer like a cocktail in a can i think is how i was describing it to people um if that were allowed which it wasn't in north carolina and i don't think it still is but if you love cocktails and you're unsure about beer this is a great introduction and also, if you if it's hot out, this is whatever time it is. This is an amazing yeah. beer. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely right. And that's a cool. That's a yeah. That the Kolsch example is a great example to bring up because I moved down to the southeast like five years ago, and the obviously kind of the necessity is the mother of invention or whatever that phrase is. It's so hot down here though. It's but okay, great. What can I drink when it's hot? We talked about white tie. Talked about a Kolsch. This beer. It's kind of like. It's almost like you start hunting through the history books or you can imagine hunting the history books and going, all right, what can I drink that's refreshing and delicious, but it's, you know, not an American light lager with nothing wrong with those, but like, what else is there? Um, and you guys have clearly explored, I guess, like the less traveled road there and this beer kind of being, and then the iterations of it, right? The one with the pie symbol. There's also key lime pie sour that you guys make as well, which is a different beer, correct? Uh, the, the key lime pie, the one with the pie symbol, that's the, that's the one the with sour. the pies in it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Kale Perfect. Yeah. yeah. And then there's lemon cucumber, which is right. the kind of sister beer to this that yeah. runs to the same time, like beginning of spring until fall time. Um, but Edward, yeah, it would be great if, where's the fall winter goes up? That's what we're mm. all waiting for. Interesting right. idea. I am, Interesting. You know? No one say Interesting. pumpkin. Nobody say pumpkin. Don't say no. pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> I think don't, that's on the bottom of the list. Don't, don't, <laughs> but don't, don't tempt, tempt me. me. I'll do it. Right. I'll do it. Oh, I'm, so, here yeah. it. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah, I'm here for it. I welcome I your pumpkin uh, spice question. latte gosa. But Perfect. we got a great question from Walt. And this is something I ask. I think I just assume everyone else knows the answer. But I, I'll to either of you, to any of you that can help Walt and myself with this, for the people that are wondering, what's like, what's the big key difference between a gosa and a and a, and a sour beer? Um, yeah, I'll I'll take this one. Go for it, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> a, a gosa is is sort of like a, a subset of sour beer. Um, there are many different types of traditional sour beers. There's like the uh, the Belgian lambics. Uh, goose, all those kind Berliner of things. Weiss, Berliner Weiss, the German. Liner. Yeah. So sour, sour is is sort of like this overarching term, and then as below it, we have all these other things, and Goza is one of those. And the main, the distinguishing thing about Goza is that it's um, made with coriander and salt. Right. Yeah, and the salts adds more of a, it does add a salty character, but it's a lot of mouthfeel. Um, I think it's the one thing that people don't realize. It's something that you see in the cocktail world a lot of times, people making a salt tincture that really adds body to it um, that sometimes you would otherwise not get just given how the, the beer is built and how acidic it is and how dry it is. It tends itself to be very lean, which is, you know, kind of the beer dissipates, but that just that slight salt character makes it kind of last on your palate a little bit more given the alcohol percentage. That's fantastic stuff. And it's wild to think that Right, 2016, only a few years ago, you know, people were like, what is this? What are gozas? And now, <laughs> right, sour beers are everywhere. So it's, again, something that a style people aren't really brewing and lost history. And it comes back. It comes back in a big way. So it's, uh, again, exciting time to be alive and be a beer drinker. Next up, we're going to do more with this beer. Actually, jump back into the kitchen, make some chicken wings with it. We've got round four of trivia. So get serious because we're getting towards the end. More fun in the beer den, and we're going to finish up with Blackberry Blueberry Smash. Let's do it. All right. For this recipe with Westbrook beer, we have the key lime pie goza. So it's a sour beer. 
Uh, we're gonna play on that sour. We're gonna do a, a sour wing. What we're gonna do is marinate the wings for a few hours in the beer. We're gonna pour this over it. We're gonna let that marinate for a good three or four hours. Uh, really wanna add that flavor of the beer to the chicken. It'll help marinate it, it'll help keep it juicy. So one thing I would like to do is now I have it in, in a container just so everybody can see it. But if we can put that in a bag, a plastic bag helps everything get evenly coated and really submerge in that beer. It also helps save room in the refrigerator. We're gonna let that sit there. And then when they come out, we're gonna do some garlic, onion powder. We're gonna put them on the grill. Coat them with a little bit of olive oil so they crisp up. Get them nice golden brown. Cook them on the grill. And we're gonna show you how to plate them. And now we're ready to grill our key lime goza wings. So the grill is nice and hot. They're already marinated, lightly oiled, seasoned with a little bit of garlic and onion powder. We're gonna throw them on there. And I, wanna, I do wanna make note about the grill temperature. We wanna crank that up as high as it will go. So right now, we're at about 500 degrees. We're gonna let them stay right on there because we do want to try to get some crisp on them. We're gonna let them stay there. We're gonna shut this and let them cook. All right, so the wings have been on there for five or six minutes. We're gonna just take them, see how they're nice, nice and golden brown. We're gonna take them and turn them. And notice I, I tried to keep the tips from falling down through the grates. That'll help them from burning too bad. There's not a lot of meat on them, but we don't want to burn them if we can help it. We're just gonna let them sit there and kind of put them over the flame so the flame comes up and kisses it. Really builds that flavor. Let them sit for another five, six minutes and they should be done. All right, now that our wings are all golden brown and cooked through, we're gonna go ahead and take them off and we're gonna put them in the bowl so we can toss them and finish them inside. Now that our wings are grilled, we're gonna go ahead and finish the seasoning process. So we have some butter. Now keep in mind, these were already tossed with a little bit of garlic powder, a little bit of onion powder, marinated in beer, and we're gonna add a few items to enhance that sweet, sour, citrusy flavor. The butter's gonna help coat the wings. We got some local honey. We got some pink sea salt. Give it a few cracks on there. A squeeze of lime. We're gonna to toss them. Really wanna make sure everything gets coated. I'm using a, a large bowl just because it is easier to, to toss everything in there. All right, once you toss, I'm gonna lay them on the plate. And we did leave the wings whole. They're a little easier to grill. A little less work cutting them apart, and I'm gonna like to eat them all anyway. So, a little different presentation on them. Cut some green onions really thin, just slide through, let the knife do the work. Gonna add that to the top. Another squeeze of lime for the key lime. Really bring out that sweet, sour, citrusy flavor. And there we go. Grilled key lime wings with Westbrook beer. I just feel challenged to keep eating. I don't know. It's probably not healthy, but that's okay. I don't know. I mean, I want Chef Joe prepare everything and they looked like healthy ingredients. That's true. That's Good. justification. Those Perfect. looked amazing. And I think if you're able to prepare those, we had the whole weekend in front of us or half of it left anyways, but head out to Lowe's, prepare those wings, and it'll feel like you've won the trivia, but 
in reality, there's only going to be one grand prize winner and five winners winners. So, I mean, there's, there's really, there's plenty of reason to celebrate, but what I'm excited to see is if anyone can unseat Kenneth starting, starting it up round four, here Let's we go. Let's go. This is it. Ooh, wow. I'm already behind. Yeah, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a feeling Kenneth may know. Yeah, Ready? that's a tricky one. I, I Mississippi oh, is the river. The Wando. Let's see. Let's see who where are we at. Is there a shakeup? The last round of this is always a blast. True. I feel like it's. Uh, oh, Whoa! Look okay. at that. It's only a hundred points between Kenneth and everybody else. Oh, it's gonna come down to the. It's gonna come to who's the fastest. Which beer? Boom! You should have this. You should be in on that. You should hopefully be almost done with it. But this is a great beer. Well, whatever beer Chef Joe recommends is the one you should be selecting right now. Answer here, yeah. On the three phones you bought to win this. All right, everybody got that one. But who got it first? That is going to make. All right. It's still a hundred spread. So it's anybody's game. I mean, really, it's going to come down to the bonus question. It really will. Yeah. This is amazing. Solve for X. <laughs> there it is right there. I see X. Ooh, this is a tricky one. Westbrook has some, can I say, weird barrels in their barrel room. Yeah, Someone very unique. asking if they name them. All right. I know which we did at the Shemini Creek, fancy names after virtues, but Rosé, all right. Okay, this had to have shaken it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it had to have, right, only 34.6%. Oh! <laughs> Kenneth was the guy, you got to be kidding me. It was me. one of them. <laughs> we're not rooting against you, Kenneth, just so you know, we're not rooting against you. Not at all. Here we go. I like the answers first, and I, I can't wait to read the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh. Animals with high alcohol tolerance. Eating wow, the fermented there's a... fruit. Is that someone, is some graduate student testing alcohol tolerance of animals in the field right now? Is that a thing? That sounds like a fun right, game exactly. to play. Right, Good here. grant, grant right. money there. <laughs> See if this back and hold this 40. All uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Kenneth. And he, and he got the 15 in there, too. It's still, I mean, right there. It's possible. Longest potential shelf life when Ooh, kept in a sealed container. Right. Love it. I love the optimism of someone putting beer in Tupperware and hoping it'll last. That's a, it sounds like a Tupperware a, advertisement. Right. It might be. Sneaky, sneaky. Yep. Buy Let's your beer not. cans and then put them in our Tupperware containers. That's right. No Tupperware answers. Good, good. We're the pros are the only ones that are left right now. Cans, overwhelmingly. Yeah. But cans are it's great a, for beer. Say sixty-five points between one and two. I mean, this is it. This is it, folks. It all really, comes down to. The, oh, there's one more. That's right. <laughs> Counting's the hardest part. <laughs> I I can't. Which of the below peppers have not been used in a creation of a Westbrook? Ooh. Good luck. Good luck. Oh, probably only a matter of time, but I'm trying to remember what's in Mexican cake right now. The uh, ghost pepper. Another this good, a, this another split good the, breakup. This split the field up, yeah, pretty well. Let's see. And I see Ed taking notes. He's like, uh, ghost claw right. IPA. Up next. <laughs> oh my gosh, Kenneth. You got to be kidding me. Does someone know Kenneth? Is Kenneth a, a member of the staff? Kenneth is a bot. No, <laughs> he's probably a real person. Here it is. Make a break. The bonus question. Whoa, oh, boy. wow. Yeah, well, that's oh, easy. Man, my... It's barley right. and I... hops, I think. That's Are they on the sure. table? Not yet. Okay. B. Probably. Wow, my high school chemistry teacher, Mr. Well, Norris, would be very upset. All about right, potassium, but that wasn't it. Uh, beryllium, a beryllium sphere from Galaxy Quest. Any uh, Tim Allen fans out there? Doesn't matter. 
Kenneth! Oh! Well, here we go. Here's your leaderboard at the end of the fourth and final round. Kenneth, congratulations on the next virtual beer hunting box uh, for winning, almost destroying this trivia. Um, We'll bring the leaderboard back up at the end just to make sure everybody sees it and you can celebrate everyone in the top five. What's coming up next, Harrison? That's right. We're going to jump back into the beer den real quick and grab some water and... Blackberry, Blueberry Smash. We're going to finish up with that and get back to see Ed and Will in just a moment. Hey, everyone. Jordan in the Beard Den here. Chef Joe, thanks for that awesome recipe. But as a Beard Den master, I've got a little recipe of my own that I want to share with you. I got my friend Steve here on the grill. Say hello, Steve. And so here's, the, here's how this recipe works. Step one, crack a beer. Oh, man. How's that taste? Awesome. Step two, gotta make sure our coals are nice and hot on the grill there. How we looking, nice and warm? Great. Step three, we're gonna throw that chicken right there on the grill. Yeah, and let that go for a few minutes on one side, have another sip. Yeah, see, that's awesome. Beautiful day out here. After a few minutes, we're gonna flip that chicken. Nice. This is a great time for another sip of that nice ice cold beer. All right, that chicken might be done. Let's take a look. Oh, that looks amazing. And that is how Beard End Master cooks with beer. This is an exciting beer. Uh, welcome back, everyone. And yes. thanks oh, for God. drinking with us. But this this is an amazing send-off. Smell it. Ed and Will pouring it into their glasses. And they know more about it than I do. So Ooh. I'd rather how how do you how do you do this? <laughs> this tastes like uh like going to a, a farmer's market in the middle of summer. Yeah, it's amazing. Um so what we do is we get the fruit and then we put it in the beer and (laughs) that's basically it (laughs) take notes at home that's it just two steps that's all yeah like the lime and the coconut very simple you know (laughs) yeah you just you just put it in in. yeah i mean it's just simply a sour wheat beer Mm -hmm. that has same Fruit. same base yeah, right. recipe as the Goza, mm-hmm. oh. just without the coriander salt addition. Mm-hmm. So it's just much more fruit forward that like that's all you're speaking to. And then given the additions, you obviously get that great color hue, which I think is so important this day for beer drinkers is mm-hmm. if you're going to put the, the fruit on there and it's and you know that those fruits have color, you want to see that color when you pour it to the point where it even influences the head of the beer to it has that like that tinge or that hue of purple or red or magenta or, or whatever yeah. you're kind of going for, which really so much of beer is when, when you see it and you have that just excitement because you know you're getting into something really interesting. Is this, Ed, this is, you you homebrewed before you decided to do it professionally and forgo all of your free time. Is this something that <laughs> you think a home brewer would be able to accomplish in the closet? Um. <laughs> kind of. Right. Um, we do. Um, so after we add the fruit, we do pasteurize, flash pasteurize the beer um, so that it doesn't continue to ferment 
the fruit sugars <laughs> and, you know, blow thank up you. in the can, hopefully. <laughs> right. Thank um, you. <laughs> and also, I mean, also by not re-fermenting the fruit, you preserve a lot of the, the fruit character, um, the flavor and the aromatics. Um, so that is where it may get tricky on a home brewing scale. Um, you could, if you didn't bottle or like package the beer in any way, you could just keep it cold in a keg um, and then that would work. But um, otherwise you need a pretty fancy class pasteurizer. Fancy and very expensive. Very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah. I think that's the tough part with a lot of fruit additions is where are you putting it? Are you putting it in the boil? Are you adding in the fermenter? Are you letting the yeast get added? Are you trying to add it afterwards? How are you safe? And just given the propensity for some things to go on that you don't necessarily want to go on with your cans of beer, um, that that's really a difficult part and something that brewers really have to, you can't just add fruit and just hope everything kind of works out. Um, and the home brewing level, no one wants to wake up in the morning and look in their closet and there be fruit puree splattered all over their clothes or anything. So it's um, Narnia. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, that's the rite of passage though. That's kind of, that's the old, it's done fermenting, honey. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. We've yeah. It's happened there. to everybody. Yeah. It's happened yeah. to everybody. I, I've, I've had those times where I was like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll put mangoes, Ooh. dry mango slices in this homebrew and let it sit there and then come back and the blow off yep. tube is shot, you know, yep. 20 feet away from where the carboy is and all that. So, oh, um, great though. Yeah. That's professional amazing. brewers still deal with those things. So, right, it's right. not an amateur thing. Mm hmm. I was going to say, yeah. What's what's it like? Is it a pretty vigorous fermentation with adding all the fruit and stuff to it as well? Are you dropping some firm cap in like the blow off buckets or is this just you got it dialed in now? No one's worried about that. Yeah, I mean, we do actually use firm cap for or, uh, you know, the commercial equivalent for almost everything we do just to keep the mess on the brewery floor right. um, to a minimum. Uh, so that, you know, the the seller, the seller people are very happy about that. Um, <laughs> No, but we actually, we don't add the fruit on this beer until the beer has been chilled. So there's no fermentation ah, happening there anymore. Oh, man, that's what I asked about that. Yeah, kind of when do the berries go in? So it's post-fermentation. It's already been already been cold crashed as well? Yep. Wow. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really cool. Um, and these berries, is it kind of like local stuff? Or do you guys have like a secret that you won't reveal, like blackberry, blueberry handler? <laughs> I actually uh, asked Edward that question during the break, and I was like, "So is it Oregon fruit puree?" And he gave me a really weird look. So I'm, yeah, I'm no, looking forward to yeah, the no. answer to this. I, I mean, we can keep it secret. Yeah, no, I, I mean, every everybody in the brewing world is very familiar and fond of Oregon fruit. Uh, yeah. We use a lot of a lot of their stuff, uh, but for these this beer, we do not get their fruit from them. It's from a, a top secret supplier. Good, good. <laughs> Let's keep it that way for now. As long as you can. As long as no one watching asks, I think we're fine. If someone else asks, I don't know what the rules are on keeping secrets, but we do have a couple of questions <laughs> from people at home watching. I have nothing to do with this, Ed and Will, but uh, let's see what some of the people from home have been asking. Cool collabs coming up. Let's hmm. see. Let me think. I don't know. That's all you, man. Uh, not that I can think of. It's been real tough in the last year, just given sure. circumstances yeah. that a lot of people have kind of. I'm sure we will have some stuff happening this summer, um, but I don't know what it is yet. Um, I don't plan too far ahead. I, so, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty. I, I'm pretty uh, spontaneous in that way, actually. So if somebody, somebody that I like, you know, or like, you know. But in a city that I like to go to, there's a cool brewery. You know, it could be a good vacation slash uh, work trip. Where does Edward want to eat a yeah. nice dinner at? And yeah, we we'll exactly. expect cool a place. collab to happen. So there it is. Yeah. I love it. What else? Uh, what, what else? about this question from Lisa? What is the history of your brewery? What is something you always wanted to do? Uh, or did you come from a different background? Like, why Charleston? There's four questions in there, <laughs> <Yeah>. but um, <laughs> I think I, I've I've heard rumors about 
the way your brewery started that I think should be a, a movie. If you want to begin there, okay. kind of how did how did Westbrook Can't Brewery wait. begin? Um, yeah, so it began because I was I became obsessed with home brewing when I was in college and graduate school. I stu- and I studied computer science and then business. So you know, kind of like unrelated to brewing, but mm. not totally. Yeah. Business is important. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know. B- business school is not about the real world, though. No. I don't know. Anyway, digression. Um, <laughs> so, no, it started because I became obsessed with home brewing, and immediately when I finished school, I was worked on starting uh, Westbrook. Um, and the reason I chose Charleston is because I'm from here. Um, I love it here. And at the time it was very ripe for another brewery uh, because we only had uh, Palmetto, which had been around since like 94, 95. And then Coast had just opened up in like 2007. But those are the only two breweries in wow. the, the low country area uh, when we started. Now there's 30. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And most of those have probably come in the last couple of years. Yeah. So. It, yeah, once the law changed in South Carolina, that really pushed everyone to to get into it. So now it's a a, a bounty of breweries in the Low Country. And good food. But here's a question from Lowe's Foods. Uh, and this, I think, this comes from Tammy. What are your visions for the future? Where do you see Westbrook five years from now? Um, and then a subtle interjection from John, are you guys trying, like, would it be a goal to get huge distribution wise, or is there, is there a sweet spot where you found yourself? Um, yeah, I would say that we are definitely in the sweet spot right now. Um, I'm very happy with the business that we have. I'm happy with the, you know, the amount of beer that we're making. I'm happy with the beers that we're making. Um, you know, I, I know everybody that we you know, are in terms of distributors that we sell beer to. Um, everything is manageable with a very small staff, uh, which I like. Um, yeah, and as far as where I want to be in five years, um, I will tell you the truth that I do not think that far ahead. So I just try to um, do things that I enjoy doing and things that I am excited about doing. Um, and honestly, I don't know where we're going to be in six months. So five years is quite a stretch. Right. Con- considering some of the, the, the fast pace character of craft beer, Brewed IPA is a perfect example of one of those things that was popular ah, before don't, it don't got talk popular. About that again. It was already <laughs> uh, so uh. you know to 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 map out that far ahead in the craft beer world or as a brewery is so difficult because you just don't know what you're going to have to do or what customers are going to want or what your accounts are going to demand or your distributors are going to demand from you. And uh, I think it's it's great when you have the ability to be agile and be able to respond to different changes in the market or how things are going and uh, it just, yeah, I, I don't blame Edward for answering in that way whatsoever. Right. Yeah, that's probably the best answer really. Keep doing what you love doing and you know, it'll take care of itself. So, all right, what do we have here? I'll take this one, John. So SC Hawkeye says Westbrook IPA is my go-to. However, I had a four o'clock yesterday in the Lexington SC Lowe's amazing Mm-hmm. How do you maintain drinkability? That's a great question. A higher ABV levels of like nine hundred percent. Yeah, that is a pretty good question. Um, so, as you increase the ABV, that means you have to increase the amount of grain, the amount of malt, um, substantially, and with that comes uh, residual sweetness. Um, so the more grain, you know, even if it ferments out a lot, you're still going to end up at a higher level of residual sugar in the beer. So one thing that we do to make that dry it out and make it a little bit more um, light bodied is we add um, corn sugar or dextrose into the boil. Um, 
that type of sugar will ferment out completely uh, with the yeast so it doesn't leave behind any residual body or sugar. Um, so that helps, you know, increase the alcohol and then lower the amount of sugar that's left in the finished product relatively. And then the other thing, of course, is the hopping rate with something like Four Claw. Um, it's like nine plus pounds of dry hops per barrel of beer. Um, so you get like a ton of, um, well, with that beer, we use all pellets. There's no um, cryo or, or extracts or anything like that. So you do get a lot of like tannin and a little bit of bitterness from just the amount of hop and yeah, vegetable sure. material that goes right. into it. So it all ends up kind of balancing out and hopefully being a enjoyable experience to drink it. And that, that corn sugar process that he's talking about is something that is almost classic. And it's one of those things that I think a lot of people just don't realize. Like Very common with uh, Belgian, yeah, high alcohol Belgian, Belgian beers. Belgian beers, like quadruples and some of those beers, there's a good amount of per percentage of that that they're using corn sugar because it gets that drinkability on those eight, nine, 10% beers that you would otherwise be like, how are these just so drinkable? Like, why could I drink them so quickly? And it's because it just, it's a way to lighten the body, but the malt character and everything else that they build in there still gives it substance to it. So you still feel like you have something, but you're not getting kind of slogged down by too much residual sugar, or it's not fusely in terms of like overly boozy or anything like that. It's just really integrated. And I think, especially with the hazy IPA style, I think those beers, do a better job of hiding some of that ABV simply because of the fruit character, how they're built in terms of low bitterness. So they're not really enhancing any sort of alcohol presence in that. And they're just meant to be clean, smooth fruit um, beers versus kind of having other things that make maybe beers at that alcohol percentage a little less drinkable than they otherwise would. It's that juice. Yeah, that, that juice. Like, I mean, that's that what people beer. want to drink is is juice with alcohol. You keep like saying that. <laughs> that's right. Right. That's exactly what we're, right. you know, if we want to break that down. Yeah, yeah sure. Low juice when you are a kid and you, now you don't have to give that up as an adult. It just gets more, maybe more enjoyable. So I'm, I can cheers that all day. Well, Ed, Will, I want to thank you guys so much for taking us through these amazing beers, giving us insights I had no idea about. I mean, I really feel very privileged to now know what I do about, you know, your amazing brewery and the, the, kind of journey you guys have been on and for everybody out there who wants to grab more west westbrook beer easy stuff go down to your local lows they got tons of it if you're near mount pleasant south carolina go visit the brewery they'll stack it with all this stuff and more you know all the time and i just wanted to say mexican cake because I haven't said uh -huh. it on this whole stream. So Mexican <laughs> cake has been said, uh, but congratulations to everybody that played yeah. trivia. You're the real winners. And then of <laughs> course, a maybe a, a double handshake to Kenneth, Yvonne, Debbie, Tina, Emily. You guys are the best trivia players and you know everybody wins, but I think there'll be something special coming from Lowe's. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for playing along with us as well. Absolutely. And thanks to the team at Westbrook, everyone behind the scenes that's, you know, putting this together on at Lowe's. I mean, there's still some of these virtual beer hunt boxes um, full of Westbrook beer as well at your local Lowe's too. So if you want to do this again, just rewatch the video a couple of times. Perfect. Yes. Go ahead down. You know, why not? Um, Maybe you'll more. be able to beat Kenneth. Right. Yeah. Just don't eat the whole thing of cheddar cheese. You know, six at once. That's going to, that'll get you like, uh, like it has me. I'm sweating. Profusely, but that's okay. It's all part of the experience. And speaking of food, we'd love to hear what you liked about this event or what we can do to help improve the next one. So scan this code on your screen, pull out your cell phone, open up the camera app, mess up, realize you opened up Facebook, go back to the camera app and scan <laughs> this QR code uh, to take a quick survey about your experience with us tonight. It should only take a couple of minutes, but we really really value your feedback plus bonus tip if you fill out the survey lowe's will email you all of the recipes from chef joe tonight so you'll be able to eat those chicken wings tomorrow uh, maybe with any luck that's right and like all good things let's end tonight with dessert so we're going to show a video now from the lowe's chefs on how to make a berry smash cake with your blackberry blueberry smash beer and until next time, guys, cheers. 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 All right.
right, for this recipe for Westbrook Brewing, we're gonna do the blackberry blueberry smash. And this sour beer, it's it's really gonna play on the, the sweetness that they put into it. I love I love the complexity of it, but we're gonna do a dessert with it. So I'm gonna show you, we're gonna use the beer to kind of marinate these berries, cook them a little bit, and really pull some of those flavors with the beer uh, together with some angel food cake and some ice cream. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, we're gonna pop the top on the beer, we're gonna pour it in, and we're gonna bring it to a boil. We're gonna add one cup of sugar. We're gonna mix that a little bit. And for the berries, so we've got one pint of blueberries, we've got one container of blackberries, and then about one full container of strawberries. Uh, we washed them all, picked through them, um, quartered the strawberries, stemmed them as well, and we're just gonna pour these right in. We're gonna let them boil in there. And really all we're doing is making sure the, the sugar does melt. So we're gonna let them, we're gonna let them cook in here. Not too long, again, we just wanna bring it to a boil. While that comes to a boil, I wanna talk about the angel food cake. So the angel food cake, one, one trick to cut this is put it in the freezer for a little bit. Pre-cut it before you have a party or you have guests over. Um, that will help cut it if you if you kind of want to hold the integrity of the cake, and then we have our ice cream, our black raspberry truffle. So we're going to get a little bit of a little bit of chocolate in there as well. This is a great ice cream, um, kind of pulling that berry flavor in again as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to start scooping some of this. Got the scoop of ice cream. We're going to get a slice of the angel food cake. And this came to a boil. We're just gonna turn this off. All the sugar is melted. Now, this is gonna go in the refrigerator and cool. Once it's cooled, you're gonna end up with this. You'll have a, a quite a bit of juice in there, and that's okay. That's where the angel food cake comes into play. So we're just gonna take this. We're gonna put some berries around the bottom. And we're really kind of playing on that sour flavor. We want the flavor of that beer to come through. We're gonna kind of pour some juice on there. Let that cake soak it up. We're gonna add a couple of scoops of ice cream with it. Now, I'm, I'm putting this on a plate uh, just so everybody can see it. It's a little easier to see on a plate, but it might be better off in a bowl. We're gonna do a couple of scoops of ice cream with it. There we go. Simple summer dessert with Westbrook beer. Adds a little twist to uh, ice cream and, and cake with berries. Enjoy.